Welcome to the show. I'm Joel Khoury, and today's topic is pseudohyponatremia. What is it? Why it happens? And more importantly, how can we put an end to it? Now, before we begin, I do want to mention that I have no financial conflict of interest to disclose, and I will be referencing Roche or Roche, depending on where you are in the world, a lot. That's not out of an abundance of love or hate, but simply because they're the instruments in my lab. So although the bigger problem affects instruments from all vendors, some of the numbers I mentioned here, specifically serum indices, are unique to Roche. So if you have Roche, go boss, you can implement these changes right away. With that out of the way, let's begin. Pseudohyponatremia is just a fancy medical term for my patient has a falsely low sodium result in blood. This lab artifact is the result of an analytical interference and primarily affects high throughput chemistry analyzers that use what we call an indirect ion selective electrode method, or ISE. That's because indirect ISE methods require samples be significantly diluted before analysis. Now, while this dilution step helps extend the life of the electrodes and lowers the volume of sample needed for testing, it creates a problem for certain patients. Here's how. Imagine you have a four mil water sample that has four sodium ions in it. If I drop an electrode in that solution, the electrode, which measures ion activity in water, will read, hypothetically, one ion per mil. Now, let's take a different solution, one with the same concentration of one ion per mil, but that has three moles water and one mil solids, like lipids or proteins. Because the electrolytes, like sodium, are only distributed in the water fraction, we will have less total ions here in the tube. Three ions, but in three moles of water. If I drop an electrode in this solution, it also will read one ion per mil. Because remember, electrodes only measure ion activity in water. All is well so far. Except now, if we take each of these samples and dilute them with water, a lot, like we do in indirect methods, and say for convenience, to a total volume of one liter, then place an electrode in each of them. The electrodes will now read four ions per liter in the first, and three ions per liter in the second. The effect of the solids coming from the original sample are negligible here, because of the significant dilution. The back calculation then to the four mil tube will be four ions per four mil, that's one ion per mil, great, but three ions per four mil, that's 0.75 ions per mil, not great. They are not measured the same as measured by the electrodes because the electrode does not know and therefore cannot account for the distribution of solids and water in the original sample. This is exactly why indirect ISE methods that involve dilution are affected by the distribution of solids and water in the sample. When the analyzer draws that sample and significantly dilutes it as part of the analysis, it will be picking up less total sodium ions in patients with high proteins or lipids, leading to a false assumption that the concentration of sodium in the water fraction is lower than it actually is. This phenomenon is commonly known as the electrolyte exclusion effect or more accurately, volume displacement effect. It is worth mentioning that the opposite effect, pseudo-hypernatremia, or falsely high sodium in blood, occurs in patients whose protein concentration is too low, shifting the plasma solids and water ratio to the other end, and causing us to report falsely high concentrations. Yeah, I know what you're thinking right now, clinical chemistry, cool. So to sum it all up, Pseudohyponatremia affects patient samples with high proteins or lipids that are measured by an indirect ion selective electrode method. Now to answer the more important question, what can we do about it? We have direct ISE methods, basically those that don't employ dilutions, like point of care devices that typically measure sodium in whole blood, and those are not affected by the volume displacement effect because they're directly measuring the sodium concentration and the water fraction of the blood. Unfortunately, these methods are not compatible with large-scale automation, so we simply cannot run all of our patients' blood samples on these devices. But 
We don't need to do that. What if we only reflex samples with significant levels of proteins or lipids to be run by direct methods? Okay, hear me out on this one. We already run lipemia index, which is sort of a surrogate for lipids, on every sample going through our chemistry automation line. And we also run total proteins on all comprehensive metabolic panels, which for us represents a source of about a third of our sodium orders uh, on the samples. So this is data we already have, and building a few simple rules in our middleware to query results and make a decision is relatively straightforward. So for instance, I would build a rule that holds all indirect sodium results with total proteins greater than nine grams per deciliter, which is equal to something in SI units, or those with a lipemia index greater than 700. This last one applies to Roche users only, because again, Roche has their own lipemia scale. And if both of these numbers sound too low to you, it's because the thresholds and current product inserts and some publications are misleading. Please pay attention when referring to product inserts and published literature on the subject. Most manufacturers set an allowable error of 10% for their interference studies, which is highly inappropriate for plasma sodium. I can land an airplane in that window. 10% represents an allowable difference of plus or minus 14 millimoles per liter for plasma sodium. For a patient with a sodium concentration of 140 millimoles per liter, that's saying it's okay if we report down to 126 millimoles per liter. That's the difference between almost severe hyponatremia and normal natremia. Unless, of course, you're using an enzymatic method to measure sodium. In which case, with a reference interval of 128 to 145, just like Pinocchio, you have other villains to worry about. There's Stromboli, Lampwick, Monstro, and I don't know, a negative anion gap on normal patients, just to name a few. Reference change value calculations for plasma sodium show that a change of plus or minus four millimoles per liter is highly significant. And in fact, CLIA requires it for acceptable test performance. That change for plasma sodium occurs at a total protein concentration greater than eight to nine grams per deciliter based on a 2019 study completed at Mayo Clinic, as opposed to the 12 grams per deciliter reported in some product inserts today based on a 10% change. This less than ideal choice of acceptability criteria by vendors and academics alike also led to an underestimating the effect of hemolysis on, on plasma sodium measurement. For hemolysis, which also falsely decreases sodium concentrations by dilution in vitro, our internal data show that a significant change in plasma sodium of four millimoles per liter or greater on Roche analyzers occurs at hemolysis index of around 200, not 1000, as currently stated based on a 10% change. For lipemia, our recently published data also shows that current product inserts are overstating the tolerance for interference because they define their lipemia thresholds by performing spiking experiments using intralipid, which is a soybean oil, egg yolk phospholipids, glycerin, and water emulsion, instead of using human samples containing high levels of endogenous lipids. We recreated the experiments vendors typically perform with intralipid using three different concentrations of plasma sodium and saw no effect up to the highest L-index tested, which is 2000 on Roche. And then we evaluated human samples with endogenous lipemia by direct and indirect methods and saw a significant difference when the lipemia index exceeded around 700. Granted, our total number of samples tested is less than 40. These are hard to samples to find. Not a single sample with L index over 1,000 was within plus or minus 4 millimoles per liter. Our conclusion is that intralipid experiments are inappropriate for evaluating the effect of lipemia interference on plasma sodium measurement. While intralipid has been somewhat useful to simulate the effect of spectrophotometric interference for other tests, it simply does not simulate the volume displacement effect seen in lipemic patient samples. We don't know exactly why this happens, but we suspect that the difference in particle size between intralipid particles and some endogenous lipids linked with pseudohyponatremia like lipoprotein X may be affecting sodium differently at different L indices. The hypothesis here is that lipoprotein X with a diameter of 30 to 70 nanometers
absorbs and diffracts a lot less light at the wavelength we use to measure L index than intralipid particles with a diameter ranging from 20 to 700 nanometers and averaging 214. That means that at the same L index, like 1000, you will have a lot more of these smaller particles in human samples than you do these larger ones in intralipid. And this higher number of particles can cause significantly more volume displacement at the same value of L index. So using intralipid to assess the effect of lipemia for plasma sodium is a lot like putting milk in a sugar cone, giving it to kids and telling them it's ice cream. I understand they're similar, but it's just not the same. There's a lot missing here. I mean, look at her face. Does that look like the face of a kid who wants to eat anything but ice cream right now? In a nutshell, pseudohyponatremia has gone unchecked for far too long because most labs and vendors have used a far too lenient allowable error for acceptability for sodium when performing interference studies, 10% instead of plus or minus 4 millimoles per liter, have inappropriately used intralipid to evaluate the effect of lipemia on plasma sodium measurements by indirect methods. Both of these actions are directly responsible for the release of inappropriately low sodium results to clinicians and the existence of pseudohyponatremia. So if you, like me, are feeling salty about it, here's what you can do to help end this now. If you're a clinical lab, lower your threshold for lipemia interference down to an L index of 700 on Roche. That may change with larger studies, but with our small data set, this is where we think the threshold should at most be. If you're using another vendor, evaluate that effect using human samples with endogenous lipemia, not intralipid. Lower your threshold for total protein interference for sodium down to at most nine grams per deciliter. And while we're at it, also set a low threshold of three grams per deciliter, because as mentioned earlier, low proteins can cause pseudohypernatremia. And yeah, that's killing two pseudos with one stone. Lower your threshold for hemolysis to around 200 on Roche. If you're using another vendor, Reevaluate the effect of hemolysis using a total allowable error of plus or minus 4 millimoles per liter, not 10%. Depending on your resources, and if you have the staff and instruments to do this, validate a direct ISE method for measuring sodium and plasma or serum in your lab and place it near your automation line. That way, you can just grab that sample when it flags, based on the new thresholds mentioned, then run it directly. If you don't have the resources to do this, at least add a comment saying that your result is affected by proteins or lipids present in the sample and recommend that they perform point of care testing by a direct method. You can also follow a traffic light resulting approach to help you manage the workload. Here's how this works. No interference present, green, release the result. Low level of interference present, for example, total protein is between nine to 11 grams per deciliter, yellow, release the result with a comment saying that the result is affected to alert your providers to be cautious about their interpretation here. That way, you're not having to run all of these samples by a different method, but at least you're flagging them for deviation. Finally, significant interference present, like proteins greater than 11 grams per deciliter, red, cancel, and if possible, run by a direct method to prevent reporting extremely false results. I realize this approach is not for everyone. It really depends on what your laboratory directors and clinicians are comfortable with. But that's just another approach to reduce the effects of the interference while managing the number of samples you have to run by a different method or cancel. Others have used calculations to correct for plasma water concentration. I have not evaluated those and cannot make a recommendation there. Five, that was a very long four. Do not run hemolyzed samples on a direct method. Just cancel and comment on those. This is very important. Direct methods cannot account for in vitro sample dilution as occurs with hemolysis. Six, and finally, for clinical labs at least. For the remaining two thirds of plasma sodium orders that do not have a total protein ordered with them, I'm not advocating for running proteins on all of them yet because we don't know the cost to benefit ratio. It's likely very high cost and little benefit. But at the very least, add a comment stating that sodium results are affected when total protein is greater than nine 
or less than three grams per deciliter. That way, your healthcare providers can be aware of this issue if they're digging deeper in the patient's medical chart. Think of it as automated education right when it matters. Of course, not all of them will notice it, but some do, and over time, a lot more will. Based on our practice, this entire process affects about 1,000 sodium results per year. In other words, that's 0.3% of our total sodium results that otherwise would have been incorrectly released as falsely low with no comment or action. This also gives you a rough estimate of the prevalence of this issue. Now, if you're from a manufacturer or regulatory agency, then you should use allowable errors that also factor in biological variability and clinical decision limits instead of an arbitrary number like 10%. For plasma sodium, that should be plus or minus four millimoles per liter. And for sodium and the other electrolytes at least, perform lipemia interference studies using endogenous lipemic samples, not intralipid. It simply does not simulate the volume displacement effects. Critics may argue that all of this is unnecessary, that clinicians know about this phenomenon and can assess serum osmolality as part of their hyponatremia workup, or get a direct sodium measurement when they need to. But because of how rarely this happens, not all of them do, and mistakes can happen with serious consequences to patients. Why else would that be the number one on the list of top 10 pitfalls in the evaluation of hyponatremic patients? So the main message from today's story is this. Pseudohyponatremia is preventable. It is time we did something about it. We now have better thresholds for lipemia proteins and hemolysis. We have this data already on most of our patients. We have middleware solutions that we could use to build rules and automate the whole process. We need to take action to kick the pseudo out of hyponatremia and put the slab artifact where it belongs in AACC's history division. That's our show. Check out our paper in Clinica Chimica Acta for more details. Special thanks to the team, Dr. Chris Cook, Mike Vera, Jasmine Messina, Nate Price, and Dr. Tom Dunan. I'm Joel Khoury. Thank you for watching.